As a cardiologist, I've spent my entire career looking after people's hearts, but that got turned upside down in 2005, when by complete chance, I was involved in the roadside resuscitation of a man in his early 50s who was participating in a fun run. That man had a heart attack and dropped dead by the side of the road. Fortunately, we got his heart beating again and he did fine. But I found out several days later I'd seen the very same man some 18 months earlier and I'd given him a clean bill of health. Shocked, I went back and looked at the notes to try and understand what had happened. It turned out that by local and international guidelines at the time, I'd done everything right for him. I'd put all his details through a risk calculator and I'd said to him, look, your risk of a heart attack in the next five years is only 6%. In fact, you get a green thermometer, you should be fine. I sent him on his merry way, only to be standing over his dead body some 18 months later. Clearly, something is wrong here. In my remaining time, what I'd like to share with you is the failing of my assessment back in 2003, how we can do better, and why we're not doing as well as we should. So when I said to this man back in 2003, look, your risk of a heart attack in the next five years is 6%, I misrepresented the facts. What I should have said to this man was, based on your characteristics, what this risk calculator is telling me is if I take 100 men with the same characteristics and follow those 100 men for five years, that six of those men, 6%, will have a heart attack. I just don't know who it's going to be. Because what I didn't really get that clearly back in 2003 was the difference between population-based probability, and that's the rate of event in a particular population with particular characteristics, and actually that's what the risk factor calculator tells us, versus individual actuality. Because the individual won't have an event, i.e. 0%, or will have an event, 100%. Think fun runner. Well, let me introduce you to the 50-year-old male 100 voice choir, and I'm somewhat embarrassed to say that the choir master had a slightly better understanding of this than I did back in 2003. And he said, OK, guys, I've spoken to the doc, and he says about six of you will have a heart attack in the next five years. Could I just ask that it's not all the tenors? <laughs> but we can be more precise. We can actually take that choir and we can put them through a process. We can look at the health of their arteries. In recent years, and this wasn't available in 2003, we've now had the progression and the widespread availability of cardiac CT imaging, which allows us to look into the heart and get a feel for the health of someone's arteries. Think mammogram for the heart, allowing us to start to see what's going on. On the left-hand side, healthy arteries. On the right-hand side, clearly a problem. And we can quantify that problem. We can start to hone in on our true high-risk individuals. And why is that helpful? Because if we can find the high-risk individuals, we can treat them, we can mitigate their risk, we can reduce heart attack, and we can save lives. Well, why aren't we doing it? Why, why isn't it happening all the time? Uh, maybe you haven't heard of it. And why would I come all the way from Australia to talk about it? Well, it turns out that cardiac CT imaging sits in a perfect storm of inertia. It's caught by the constraints and processes of medicine, the influence of money, and the human mindset. When it comes to medicine, modern medicine dictates the highest levels of evidence to inform our treatment strategies. That makes sense. But let's think about cardiac CT and the question being asked, does cardiac CT guided therapy improve outcome. So we take our group of people, we scan them, we put some people in a treatment group after randomization and some in a non-treatment group. Now, if you're following me, how would you be if you were in the non-treatment group but you'd been scanned and something was found in your arteries? You would probably be just a bit uncomfortable with that. In fact, you wouldn't be told because it would have been a blinded study. So you hopefully didn't go in the study in the first place, and I can tell you a doctor like me wouldn't want to put my patients in something like that, and there isn't an ethics committee in the world that would allow that particular study to proceed, which is a good thing. So we may never actually get the highest level of evidence 
to support this particular therapy and the question we want to ask. So if we can't get the highest level of evidence, what's next? Well, we can use observational data. Let's step outside of medicine momentarily, and I think we'd all agree that we don't need to randomise people to parachute or no parachute and push them out of a plane to test the hypothesis that parachutes work. Do we? Well, what about medicine? Is there a precedent in medicine? I mean, we know smoking is bad, but there's never actually been randomised trials to tell us it is. It's all observational data. We know it's not good for us because it's overwhelming observational data. But we're talking about x-ray today. We know that we use the x-ray to help us eradicate tuberculosis. And you know, that strategy, that therapeutic strategy, which just about did its job, was never tested in a randomised control trial. We just did it because it worked. The irony of this discussion, of course, is that the very risk calculator, which is our current gold standard for evaluating risk, has never been assessed by a double-blind, randomised control trial itself. And yet we have tens of thousands of observational data sets clearly demonstrating to us that if there's a lot of plaque or stuff in your arteries, you're at high risk. If there's not, you're at low risk, and we can use that information to bring precision to an individual's risk stratification. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending where you stand, us doctors get paid a lot more money to wait till you're sick and try and fix you up. Good for us, not so good for you, but the whole process of being ill is hugely expensive. Devices, therapies, things we insert, it means that research is driven towards cure-based mentality. And in fact, your local hospital, of course, doesn't make any money if you're well. It only makes money when you're sick. Unfortunately, medicine is huge business. And prevention just doesn't pay. And while that's the case, we're going to have a lot of trouble with medicine actually receiving the priority and the attention it truly deserves for your best benefit. The mindset's interesting, and I'm talking about a different way of evaluating risk, but already there's an established way set up by organisations, institutions and individuals over a period of time. Well, to shift that, we have to recognise that change always pushes back. So we need to be open and understanding of how we can facilitate that. But one of the interesting things to me is that the human mindset almost seems programmed to respond to emergency. We're not programmed to prevention. I mean, what child in their right mind asks for a safety manual for Christmas? They want a fire truck. And what young man checks out the seatbelts when really he wants to know how fast does that car go? And even adults, even our leaders, confronted with decades' worth of scientific data, will wait until a crisis to actually act. No, we need to take a leaf from the ancient Chinese who recognised that superior doctors prevent the disease. Mediocre doctors treat the disease before evident, and inferior doctors treat the full-blown disease. Advocacy is the process of taking something to government and getting it out to the community. Just try and imagine momentarily a group of people suffering with a particular cancer and a new therapy becomes available. That group get organised, they approach the government to access to get access for the community for that treatment, and it's brought out to the community. Well, if we think about cardiac CT, who are the advocacy group? Because there's six men in that choir who don't know they should be advocating to look after their own lives, because nothing's happened to them yet. There is an organisation of doctors who work both locally and internationally advocating the cause because they understand the benefit of benefit of it. And interestingly, this technology is um, standard practice for NASA astronauts and presidents of the United States, but not for you and me. What does that say? One of the other things that I find intriguing is we almost seem to treat differently a life depending on how it's lost. And that's probably partly to do with the media. I think we'd all be aware of the plane crash last year in Ethiopia. It was a Boeing Max 7 flight, 257 people died. It was front page news around the world, yet heart attack kills more men and women, and women in the Western world than anything else. We're talking nine million people 
per annum. To put that into some sort of local context, that's the states of Mississippi, Louisiana and Arkansas. Their entire population is dispatched each year with this condition. In the United States, we're talking 640,000 people per annum. That's one in four deaths. And by the time I finish presenting, 10 to 15 people will have had a heart attack and died. But they're just statistics. But this one grabs me. 20% of these individuals are 65 years of age or younger. These are people who are not ready to die. These are people who still have plenty of life to live and plenty of life to give. Gary was 53 years of age and could have been one of those statistics. But I can tell you he's a father of three. Heart attack destroys families. It takes away loved ones. It devastates communities. I mean, for goodness sake, it took Elvis at 42 years of age. Today, yeah, it's a joke. You can laugh about that. I mean, it's a tragedy, but it's a, meant to be a joke. We need, we need to move from inertia to momentum. It's time to bring pragmatism to process. It's time to truly value prevention over cure. And it's time to change the way we think about heart attack. My presentation today is the beginning of a conversation on a continuum of change, which includes education, implementation and realisation for a better world for less deaths from heart attack. For those here, and if anyone sees this on video, my hope is that I've informed and encouraged you to share this conversation, because the more we share this conversation, the greater the chance we can drive the change, we can shift the inertia from the bottom up, because it's taking too long from the top down. It's not okay anymore to just wish upon a star and hope everything will be okay. It's time to draw a line in the sand. It's time to act and do something. Put your hand up if you feel comfortable to share what I've shared with you tonight with your family, your loved ones, your community to make a difference. Please do that. Please make a difference. Please save a life. Please go and do something positive about this. We can stop heart attack. Thank you so much for your attention. I, gen I genuinely wish you all good health and don't die from a heart attack. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>